Привет, Дот Next. Как дела? So, yes, I'm uh, really happy to be back here, Dot Next, in St. Petersburg. It's my third time at this conference. Um, I'm going to be closing out uh, tomorrow with a keynote, with a talk that's kind of more high level. But they've also invited me to do a talk today, which is, it's kind of weird. It's like three talks in one, because it's a story of how I implemented a programming language that was invented as a joke. So it's a combination of the kind of story of this, this language that I created, a whole bunch of deep dive stuff about how you actually build and implement compilers and parsers and these kinds of things in .NET. And then at the end of it, we're going to do some live coding. I'm going to show you how to add some of the weird features about this language into an actual live running .NET project. So how many of you have ever heard of Rockstar developers? Because if you go online and you look for jobs on any IT job site, you will find that there are companies all over the world who want to hire Rockstar developers. Now, I don't know what a Rockstar developer is. Nobody knows what a Rockstar developer is. Scott Hanselman wrote this great article years ago where he's like, there is no such thing as a Rockstar programmer. We're all writing code. Sometimes we have good days. Sometimes we have easy projects. But you know, there's, there's this dumb idea in IT that there are these amazing rock star programmers out there who are like 100 times better than everyone else. And if you can hire one of those people, then it'll just make all of your problems go away and everything will be brilliant, right? Then last year, a guy called Paul Stovell. Does anyone use a thing called Octopus Deploy? So yeah, Paul is the founder of Octopus Deploy. I follow him on Twitter. And he tweeted this. He said, to really confuse recruiters, somebody should make a programming language called Rockstar. And I thought, now this is an interesting idea. And I sort of ignored it for a couple of weeks. I thought, somebody else is going to come along, and they're going to do this, because it's such an obvious idea. And nobody did. Now, when I was not wasting my childhood learning how to program computers, I was spending my childhood listening to these kinds of people. And so I spent my whole life going, do I want to be a computer programmer or do I want to be a musician? And I thought, if I invent a programming language where you can write programs that are also songs, I won't have to choose anymore. I can do both of these things. So I thought, what if we make a language, Rockstar, for creating computer programs that are also song lyrics. And we nick all kinds of ideas from these kind of 1980s hard rock and glam rock and heavy metal bands that I love. Now, this started out as a joke. I was in a bar with a beer and a laptop, and I thought, I'll write a specification for this, and I'll put it up on GitHub, and you know, just see if, if anybody has a bit of a laugh at it. So, I didn't want it to look like other programming languages. I want it to look like songs. So hello world in Rockstar is really easy. It's just say hello world. But you can also scream hello world, or you can whisper hello world, because you've got to be able to write songs with this thing, right? Or you can shout hello world. I was thinking, how do you do variables and assignment in a language that lets you write songs in it? Now, most languages have something like int x equals 5 semicolon. You can't really sing that. And var my underscore string equals open quote hello world close quote semicolon. And the message equals hello dot next. Now, I spent a lot of time when I was younger working in languages like VBScript and Perl, which are weird languages because they don't they do some odd things. And now I'm working in Ruby, and that's really strange. It's nice being back in .NET for this kind of thing. And I started thinking, well, what if we took some ideas from those languages? Let's use dynamic types for everything. So we don't need any type declarations. Everything's dynamic. And then instead of equals, we can just use this English word is. X is 5. My string is hello world, the message. And then I thought, and I got this idea from Douglas Crockford, the JavaScript engineer, the person who wrote JavaScript, the good parts. I saw a great talk that he did a couple of years ago where he said, we spend all this time arguing about do we want Pascal case or camel case or underscores or whatever. What people really want is variables with spaces in them. And I thought, OK, this is a joke language. We can do that. We can put variables with spaces in them. And the way that I thought we could do this is, let's say we've got simple variables that just work like they do in other languages. And then we can have common variables. So you have my, or an, or your, or a, or the. So you've got all these ideas, my heart, an ocean, your dream. You can see how you could use this to make programs that also look like songs, right? And then I thought, well, if you start 
every identifier with a capital letter, we can put names in there, like Billie Jean and Black Betty and Dr. Feelgood. I'm probably one beer in at this point. I go and get another beer, and I start thinking, I don't like the fact that most languages require you to write numbers all over the place. How can we come up with a better way of doing that? And I thought, what if, what if we take the lengths of the words on the line and we treat those as digits? So instead of fizz is three, buzz is five, fizz is ice, buzz is dying, the limit is a love-struck lady killer. And then we're going to take the lengths of the words, three, five, we're going to take them modulo 10, because you can't have digits 11, 12, 13. And that's how you can initialize variables without having to put digits in your code so that it looks more like songs. We got numbers. I started thinking, OK, what can we do now? So we've got arithmetic. How are we going to do equations when you're not allowed to use any plus and minus symbols and stuff? And I thought, well, in English, simple sums. You know, the total equals price plus tax. But we also say, well, the total is the price plus tax. And we also say, well, the total is the price with tax. And I thought, let's define aliases, common, you know, everyday English words for all these different kinds of arithmetic. So the price with the tax, the total without the tax, the quantity of the product, multiplication, the distance over the time, anyone done physics, that's how you calculate speed, that's division. But of course, you can be far more interesting because you can also write equations like a girl with a dream, a man without a face, the wings of the night, a whisper over the water. We're onto something here, OK? We need comparison. You can't have loops and conditionals and things. So I thought, all right, well, for equality, let's use is. Your love is a lie, true or false. The whiskey ain't the answer, true or false. My heart is stronger than steel, greater than. My soul is weaker than water, that's less than. My will is as strong as a lion. Your lies are as low as a snake. We're getting somewhere with this, probably three beers in by this point. Functions. Now, I wanted to use a function syntax where you didn't have to use brackets or braces or commas or any of that kind of stuff. So I thought, how do you create functions just using English words? Okay, so we have a function here. This is maximum. Maximum takes x and y. If x is greater than y, give back out x, else give back y. It's pretty readable, right? Modulus takes a number and a divisor. This is how you do modular arithmetic. While a number is as high as a divisor, put a number without a divisor into a number. So this is a very simple one-line loop syntax. It's a while loop here. Give back a number. Now let's mix it up a little bit. Midnight takes your heart and your soul. And while your heart is as high as your soul, put your heart without your soul into your heart and give back your heart. This is modular arithmetic, but it's also the first line of fizzbuzz.rock. Desire is a love-struck lady killer. My world is nothing. Fire is ice. Hate is water. Until my world is desire, build my world up. If midnight taking my world, fire is nothing, and midnight taking my world, hate is nothing, shout fizzbuzz and take it to the top. And we go round and round and round, and I thought, that's it. We're done. You know, it's time to go home. I've invented a programming language where we can write fizzbuzz, which means we can do interviews. Boom. And I put it on Twitter, and I said, hey, everybody. I've invented this language called Rockstar because I thought it would be fun. And I went to bed, and it went crazy. So Hacker News picked it up, and people started going, this is brilliant, I love it. And Corey Doctorow on Boing Boing found out about it and wrote this whole article. It's just a spec at this point. It's one readme file on GitHub. It made it onto Reddit. People on Reddit said nice things about it. People on Hacker News said nice things about it. Someone said, how come goes to 11 because of the whole spinal tap thing? People started coming up with you know, all these kinds of interesting ideas. The docs for this thing are hilarious. I'm sold. Shut up and take my money. Then something really weird happened. I got an email from a journalist who works at Classic Rock magazine which is nothing to do with software. Classic Rock is a real magazine in the UK that normally interviews people like the Rolling Stones and Guns N' Roses. And they emailed me and said, what's this rock star language that everyone's talking about? Can we do an article? I thought, this has gone a little bit crazy. So yeah, I did a, 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 this interview with, with Classic Rock magazine. And then people started filing issues on GitHub and going, <laughs> 
I found a flaw in your specification. I found a bug. I've got this idea. And I dug a little deeper. I found out the people who were filing these issues were implementing Rockstar. They were actually building a real working implementation of the language that I invented in a bar for a joke. And they were coming back to me and going, I'm not sure what this is supposed to do. And I was like, I don't know. It's a joke language. <clears throat> but it didn't go away. Um, on New Year's Day this year, it made the front page of Reddit with like 25,000 upvotes and stuff. And I just kept getting all this interest from people. Like, I just found out about Rockstar. How do I use it? How can I get involved? What can I do with it? And I thought, what if it was real? You know, what if we take this, this joke idea that I had and we turn it into a real programming language that you can actually use to do things? Now, I'm not saying you should use Rockstar for anything real. Please don't do that. We have enough problems with Ruby and Python as it is. But it's a really, really interesting exercise to study how you actually build compilers for esoteric programming languages. So now, part two of the talk, we are going to build a compiler in .NET in about 25 minutes. Actually, we're going to watch little videos of us building a compiler step by step. And I'm going to get to a baseline. Now, we're not doing the full Rockstar spec, which is on GitHub, because it's huge and it's full of stupid ideas. But we're going to implement a cut down version of that, which is a little language I call Zeppelin, because Led Zeppelin is where rock and roll all started. So let's talk a little bit first about the theory of, of compilers and how they actually work. So we've got our FizzBuzz program, FizzBuzz.rock. Now, there are three ways we can run that program and see what it does. One of them, we can use a transpiler. Now, what a transpiler does is it takes Rockstar and it translates it into a language we already know how to run, like Python or Ruby or uh, C Sharp or JavaScript. And there's a couple of implementations on GitHub where other people have built transpilers for, for Rockstar. Then you take that Python file, you run it through Python, you get output. Another way of doing it is you take your source code and you run it through a real compiler which outputs an executable, native executable for whatever platform you're running on. You run that, you get your output. The third way is that you feed your Rockstar program into an interpreter which analyzes that program, runs it for you, and tells you what the output is going to be. Now, the point is, all three of these produce the same output. They're different ways of accomplishing the same thing. Now, the thing we're going to look at today, we're going to build an interpreter. So we're going to build a program in .NET that will take a Rockstar program and produce the output. It'll tell you what that program actually does. Now, in order to build interpreters, there's kind of two stages to it. We've got our Rockstar program. We want to turn that into some output. And we want to run it like, well, Rockstar, hello world.rock, and that's going to print hello world, or whatever the output of that program is going to be. Now, in order to do this, we need to do two things. We break the problem down into two parts. We take the source file, source.rock, and we run it through a parser. The parser will produce something called an abstract syntax tree. The abstract syntax tree is then fed into an interpreter that tells you what that program would do. Let's talk a little bit more about it. So let's say we have a Rockstar program here, which is just the number 23. That produces a syntax tree that says, I found a number. That number is 23. Let's add an expression. Say we have something like 23 plus 45. This creates a binary tree. So binary here is referring to something that has two arguments, takes two parameters. So the syntax tree for this is a binary operation with two arguments. One is a number 23. One is a number 45. A little bit more complicated. 23 plus 45 over 2. Do you ever see those Facebook quizzes where it's like banana plus hat plus cowboy equals 16, banana plus banana equals 12, what is a red car? And everyone argues about it because they don't understand the, the order of arithmetic operator precedence. This is how you implement that in parsers, and we'll look at how it's actually done in a minute. But we have a rule in here that says, well, divide binds tighter than add. So when you see this, what it means is 45 divided by 2, and then 23 plus that. And if you look at the tree here, we've got, we're adding together two things. One of them is the number 23. The other one is, well, what do you get if you divide 45 by 2? We change it over, 45 divided by 2 plus 23. It changes the order of these things, but you notice we're still doing the division first 
to get this result and then adding it in. So this is how you avoid ambiguous expressions. Go for something a little bit more complicated. 23 plus 45 over 2 minus 9. Okay, well, it's adding this to this, and this thing is this minus this, and this thing is this divided by this. These parse trees can get quite complicated quite quickly, but the point is they allow you to represent the structure of your program in a way that has nothing to do with the things like you know, block syntax and angle brackets and braces and things. Any program that represents the same syntax will turn into the same tree, so we can then use that tree as a basis for actually running it. So this is the sort of thing that we're going to be looking at. We've got a little piece of Rockstar script on the left here. The night was wild and stormy. The wind was howling free. Let the dawn be the wind over the night. Whisper the dawn. And this is going to give us a block. And the block is an assignment. The night was. It's an assignment. The wind was. It's another assignment. Let the dawn be this expression. And it's an output. Whisper something. And then you can see over here, this assignment is going to take the night and load it with 436. 436. 74, the dawn will be a division of the wind and the night because we've decided over here represents division. Output, look up the dawn. So we're going to build a program that can take Rockstar code or Zeppelin code, which is like a subset, can turn it into these kinds of trees and run them and tell us what it's actually going to do. So start off right at the beginning. .NET new solution. No, we'll make a directory first. So make a directory. CD Zeppelin, .NET new solution. Yep, solution's useful if we want to add other projects and things to it. We're going to .NET create a new console application, which we're going to call Zeppelin. That's where we're going to do most of the work. We're going to check that it builds. So add the solution, the project to the solution file. .NET build should come up green, because if it doesn't, Microsoft is selling us bad code. It's green. Thank you, Microsoft. We're going to go into the project file. We're going to do a .NET run, and boom, there we go. Hello, world. OK. We are up and running, literally the simplest .NET project. Next thing that we're going to do, we're going to fire that up in Visual Studio Code. So there you go. Simple .NET console application, hello world. Now, we are going to add a package. The package we're going to add is a thing called Pegasus. Pegasus is a grammar generator. It's a parser generator for .NET. It's available on NuGet. And what Pegasus does is allow us to write our language syntax as a set of rules that we can then use to automatically generate a parser for us. Now, this thing here is called a peg file. It stands for parsing expression grammar. And we're going to create the simplest possible parser. We're going to write a parser that knows how to recognize numbers. So we're going to create a parser rule. Now, this peg file is using parsing expression, gra expression grammar syntax, which I'll explain through the course of the talk. We've got a rule here that says, OK, a number equals, we'll go back to that in a second. Basically, it equals any digit, 0 to 9 plus, so one or more digits. Then we are going to add that into the solution using this special item type, peg grammar, which tells .NET, when you see this file, use this special step to build it. And what it's going to do for us when we run a .NET build is it is going to generate a parser file for us. Now, if we go in and have a look at what's actually been generated, in the debug folder here, there's a file called Zeppelin peg. So it's auto-generated. Don't mess with this. One, it's really confusing. Two, if you break it, nothing will work. And this shows you the amount of code that gets generated by Pegasus just to be able to parse numbers. So it's doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Doesn't make it easy, but it makes it easier. Now, the things we're interested in here is the namespace is parser. The class name is called parser, and there is this method called parse on there. So how do we use it? Let's go into our main method, and we're going to say parser equals new, and we're just going to use that default namespace that got generated for us, parsers.parser, and we are going to feed it a little piece of text. We're going to feed it one, two, three, and we're going to spit out the result. So there's a the result. Console.write line that, and let's see what we get. And we've got a read-only collection of string, obviously. The reason why that's happening is that the default value, let's just dig into that, and I'll explain why, why it's doing what it's doing. Um, 
we've defined a rule there which says match digits, one, two, three, four, five. And the way Pegasus works by default is that it is matching each of those digits as a separate string. Not entirely what we want, one of the first things we need to get around. So we're gonna go into our grammar file now, and we're just gonna change the definition of this rule a little bit, and we're gonna say, uh, what are we gonna say? We're gonna say, right, this is quote, quote. In Pegasus syntax, that means whatever you find here, please give us back the whole thing as one big string. That's what we want here. N here denotes a named rule, so we've said when you find a bunch of these, put them in a string, give us back that, bang. Now we have one, two, three as the output from our parser. Okay, let's do something a little bit more sophisticated here. So the next thing that we wanna be able to do, at the moment we're parsing things, we're not doing anything terribly exciting with it. We're gonna plug this in, so when we go in to say, run the program, we're actually gonna read the input from a file, so we don't have to put strings in the code. We're gonna have a program in here called program.zep. Now, I love this, when you create program.zep, ah, it's not doing it today. Um, Visual Studio Code says, hey, there are add-ons in the marketplace for Zeppelin files. I'm like, what do you mean? I literally just invented this like one second ago. This isn't a thing. Um, there we go, let's create a program. So we're just gonna create a program here, one, two, three, we're gonna save this as program.zep. And there we go, boom, look, Apparently it can help us with it. I don't know where it's getting that from. Okay, next step. What do we get when we actually run this thing? So, what we wanna do, those abstract syntax trees we were talking about, we're gonna build a tree using .NET type objects. So we're gonna create an abstract class called a syntax node. It represents one of those little blue tiles on the tree that we were talking about. And the simplest one we can do, we're gonna build a thing called a number. So syntax node is the abstract base class. Everything in the tree derives from syntax node. We're gonna create a number node which is a wrap around a decimal which will allow us to recognize numbers. We're gonna go in and edit our grammar and we're gonna say when you find this rule here, give us back a number node, that's the return type of this, and create a new number node using decimal.parse from whatever the string that you found in there. So we're gonna take a string, turn it into a number, put that inside a number node, give that thing back. Now, when we go in and run this now, what we're gonna see is, nope, we're not, we're getting ahead of ourselves. <laughs> so, the other thing we're gonna do here, we want the ability to create output from our programs. So we're gonna go and we're gonna put a rule in here that says, all right, we're also are gonna support say. So we've got number nodes, we know how to parse strings of digits. We're gonna put in an output node which knows how to render things out to the system console. So we now have these two kinds of syntax node in our tree. We've tried to run it, it's blown up, output node could not be found. Well, that's what we expect. We've put a rule in here that says, give us an output node, we haven't actually written it. So let's go in and create the output node class that we're gonna be using for this. Output node again derives from syntax node. Now output node can take, at the moment, the only things we've got are numbers. So if we give it a number, it's gonna print that number out to the console. So output node, here's the constructor, give us a number, we'll remember the, that point in the tree, we're gonna print a number, and then later we'll worry about how to actually go and run that code. Got those in, move that into its own file. Let's run the build again. You get little snippets into all my history and stuff here. Okay, so .NET run. At the moment, all we're doing with that is we're taking the output of the parser and printing it to the console. Our program said say one, two, three. We have an output node progress, but it's not really getting us anywhere. So, we're gonna build an evaluator. We're gonna build something we can take the tree, pass it into the evaluator and say, hey, run this program and tell us what this does. And the basic top level method of the evaluator is just gonna be a method called evaluate. It gives back object because we don't know yet what it is. Rockstar is a dynamically typed language. And we're gonna say, we're gonna give you a syntax node. 
And we want you to evaluate that node and tell us what it's going to do. Now, number nodes are easy to evaluate. They've got this value in them. We know it's a decimal. So if we give you a number node, take the number out, give us the number back. If we give you an output node, run this method. So I'm going to create a method called output, which does output things. And in here, we're going to say, all right, well, output nodes contain a value. We need to know what the value is before we can render it. So evaluate the number that's wrapped up inside this node. And once you've got the result back, please write the result to the screen. And then we've just made a design decision that if you output an expression in Zeppelin, the result of that output expression will be the thing that just got printed, just got rendered. If we hit a node that we don't know what it is, we are going to throw a new exception and just say unknown node type. We, haven't, we don't know how to deal with this because we're going to be implementing stuff in the parser, and then we're going to be implementing stuff in the evaluator. And I think I've edited out most of the unknown node type errors from the videos, but you may see one or two over the course of what we're doing here. OK, there we go, the simplest possible evaluator. This thing can take trees that have numbers and outputs. It can print them out to the screen. Let's run it and see if it works. It's exciting, this, isn't it? Boom. So this is our syntax tree. We've got an output node containing a number node containing one, two, three. But what you'll notice that's interesting is we've only parsed the first line of the program. Because we don't have any notion of what's called a block. We don't have any idea of do this, 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 multiple statements. So the next thing we need to do is to add some rules to our parsing grammar that say, all right, this is a block. A block node is a list of statements the only statement we support at the moment is an output, and output only knows about numbers. Now, this is a really, really neat, elegant pattern we're going to see several times. A block is either a statement followed by an end-of-line character followed by a block, or it is a line. This is anyone done anything with Lisp or scheme programming? You come across this idea a lot. You have a head and a tail, and you build lists by saying, a list is a thing with a list attached to it. And the next thing is a thing with a list attached to it. And that's also a thing with a list attached to it. It is an incredibly powerful recursive pattern for defining these kinds of behaviors. So we're going to say, OK, a block node contains a list of syntax nodes. This is called statements. These are the steps in our program that we want to be able to run. We need to plug in a system.collections.generic in order to make that work. And we're going to put in a constructor that says, right, if I give you a syntax node, please make me a program that does one single statement. New list, and we're going to use the inline initializer syntax there and plug in that node to it. Now, there's one other thing that we're going to need to be able to do here. This is going to blow up. And it's going to blow up because uh, unterminated code section. Let's have a look at what the mistake in the grammar there is. We haven't told it how to make one of those. If we get a list, what we want to do is say, we'll make us a block node with the first one, and then concatenate the rest of the block onto the end of that. And in order to do that, we are going to need to define a concat method. Now, concat exists in link. It's available on lists and enumerables and collections and all kinds of .NET. I'm a big fan of if you can copy something that's familiar to developers to do your own stuff with, go for it. So I'm going to define a concat method on these blocks. So I can say, well, here's a block and there's a block, and I want you to glue the other block onto the end of this one. This statements dot add range, take all the statements from the tail, add them to this one, and away we go. And then return this, which is important because the thing we want to give back is the program with all of the additional statements bolted onto it. Boom, okay, so now our parse tree here is saying, all right, that works. We found a block here. It's got an output of 1, 2, 3, an output 4, 5, 6, output 7, 8, 9. But then when we try and interpret it, unrecognized node type. We've told it how to recognize blocks. We haven't told it how to run them. So next step, what do we actually do to make that thing work? We're going to add some code to our evaluator here. We're going to put in a method that knows how to recognize blocks. Find a block node, give it to this method. This method will know what to do. What this method does is say, well, OK, we may need a result. So let's create an object that we can store that result in. And then we're going to go through every statement in that block, and we are going to evaluate them, just one after the other. And every time, we're going to capture the result 
in case this happens to be the last thing. So the behavior we've got here for free is the same as languages like uh, Visual Basic and Ruby, where the last thing left on the stack at the end of a function is the thing that's going to get returned by that, that block, that scope. If we see a block node, call block, pass the block node into it, run that. See what we get here? Boom. So we've got, this is our syntax tree, and then our output is producing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Three output statements, three lines. Right. Next thing we want to be able to do is get a little bit more flexible. This is going to be no fun if all we can use is numbers. So we're going to take our output node here, and we're going to say, well, actually, what if we could output any syntax node? Let's just throw the number type to one side for a second. Put in any syntax node, we're going to call this expression. So output node says, here is an expression. Please output the result of this expression. We're going to plug the syntax node in there. We're going to rename that just to keep things kind of a little bit clean and easy. And then we just need to update our evaluator. So at the moment, when we call output, it's expecting the thing we give it to have a number. We can change that. We can just say, OK, evaluate whatever the expression is that was attached to that. Now, up until now, our parser, our grammar, only knows how to recognize outputs that have a number attached to them. Output equals the word say, which is a language keyword, followed by n, which must be a number. We want to change that around because we want to get a little bit more flexible. So we're going to go in and we're going to edit the grammar in here. And we're going to define a new rule, which is called expression. So an expression is anything that will return a value, anything that, that yields some kind of value when we evaluate it. So we're going to create a new thing now at the moment. The only type of expression that we've got is anybody? Number. So we're going to plug that in. We're going to say, right, well, you can say any kind of expression, but at the moment, the only kind of expression we've got is number. We're going to jump back over into our interpreter code. We're going to run that, and we're going to see what it does. No, we're not. Yes, we are. We're going to skip a step, and we're going to start implementing arithmetic. So the reason why we want to do that is we want to implement addition. We want to be able to add together multiple uh, numbers, do simple arithmetic with it. And the way that we're going to do that is we are going to go in and we are going to define a type of syntax node called an addition node. Now, addition at this point is going to take two things. It's going to take a left-hand side and a right-hand side, both of which we're going to say can be any syntax node. So one day, we're going to have to work out how to add together arbitrary things, but we don't have to do that just now. Left-hand side, right-hand side, and we're going to put in a constructor that just says, if you give me two syntax nodes, I will register the fact that you want to try and add those two syntax nodes together. Plug in both of those. And now, we should be able to go in and say, all right, one, two, three, plus four, five, six. What do we get if we try and say that? Run it. Boom. Unrecognized node type addition node. We taught it how to recognize them. We haven't taught it how to actually do anything with them. But if you look at the syntax tree we've got here, we've recognized that we've got a block which has an output which is an addition, which is one, two, three, and four, five, six. And we've got a block which is an addition, four, five, six, and seven, eight, nine. So, what do we need to do to actually make the thing work? We need to add a new case statement. This, by the way, is the, um, the new, I think it's a C Sharp 7 thing. It lets you switch on the type of an expression and assign it to something based on the results of the switch. So we've said, if the node here is an addition node, call it A, pass it into this addition method. Now, we're going to have a bit of a problem here, because left-hand side and right-hand side are object, and .NET is a statically typed runtime, C Sharp is a static language, you cannot just randomly say object plus object. It does not know what that means. So we're going to need to go and dig in a little bit deeper and come up with some syntax to fix this. So what we're going to do is put in a switch that says, all right, well, before you add them together, 
Let's take a look and see if they are both decimals, because all the numbers we've got in our little language at the moment are using .NET decimals to represent them. And if they are both a decimal type, cast left, cast right, both of those to decimals, and return it. And if they're not, throw a new exception that says, I can't add this type and that type. This is one of the interesting pitfalls. The first Rockstar interpreter that I built was in JavaScript. JavaScript is crazy, there are no rules, you can add together anything you like and it'll just make something up. So, because Rockstar's dynamically typed, JavaScript was very, very easy for a lot of this. When you get over into .NET land, you suddenly end up with lots of things where you're trying to use a statically typed language to represent a dynamically typed language, and you have lots of fun with it. One of the things I'm gonna look into is using dynamic for these objects as well. But, let's run over and see what we got now. So we should be able to add, boom, there we go. So one, two, three, plus four, five, six is 579. 456 plus 789 is 1245. We've implemented a simple language parse that allows us to do addition statements. Now, what if we want to try and do this? 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. We should be able to do it. We know how to support addition. But if we go in now and try and run that code, it's going to fail. What we're going to do in order to support this is we are going to define a new kind of expression, which is an addition expression. And we're going to say addition is a syntax node, takes a left-hand side, which is a number, and a right-hand side, and this is where we're going to do something clever. We're going to say that you can take an addition, and you can add more additions to it. So you can have one plus two plus three, and it'll just go, yep, I know what that means. Or an addition can be a number. We feed that back in here. This is the parse tree we get out of it now. The block is now an output of the addition one, two, three, four, five. It's called recursive descent parsing. We go all the way down. This is the descent. And then we say, OK, four plus five, feed that up. Three plus that, feed that up. Two plus that, one plus that. OK, output that. That's the recursive part. And we get the result 15. So we've just implemented one plus two, like chained arithmetic. We haven't had to change our evaluator. We haven't had to change our code. All we've done is modify the grammar to say, if you see one of these plus one of these, this is what you should respond to it with. What if we want to support multiple types of arithmetic operators? So we're going to jump in here. We're going to say 1 plus 2 times 3 plus 4 times 5. This thing is probably going to blow up in the first instance, but let's run it and see. And it's going to say, failed to parse program which, by the way, is the most useful error message that Pegasus gives you, and you just kind of have to scratch your head and figure out what happened there on your own. So we're going to jump in, and we're going to say, OK, well, expression. Now, at this point, we're doing something interesting. We're saying an expression is always a product. And a product can either be an addition times a product. I'll share the slides later. You can scratch your heads over this one. Or it can be an addition. What this syntax gives us is that whole operator precedence thing that you get on Facebook with the bananas and the cowboy hats. Because we're saying, all right, well, the most important thing in this language is multiplication. Products always win. And if you can't find anything to multiply together, then look and see if you can, anything you can add. And if you can't find any of those, then look and see if anything in here is a number. And if you can't find any of those, boom, failed. You could not pause the program. Just by adding this relatively simple thing. We need to plug in another kind of node now. So we've got this addition node. We're going to create a new one. We're going to copy that and call it product node. So this will be the thing that knows how to store multiplication operations. You may notice this, there is some redundancy creeping into the code at this point. So now we've got one of those. We're going to run it. And what do you think we're going to get? our old friend unrecognized node type, because we haven't told the evaluator how to multiply things. But here's our syntax tree. We've got additions. We've got product is addition. And yeah, so product is there, product is there. So we've built something now that knows how to parse this plus that times this plus that times this plus that. Let's clean some things up a bit. So instead of having separate types for addition and multiplication, we're going to create a single node, which is a binary node, like the ones I showed you in the trees earlier. We're going to say a binary node takes a left-hand side, a right-hand side, and an operator. So we're going to just rename one of these, and we're going to plug in this operator type we've just defined. An operator here is an enum. It supports 
addition, it supports multiplication. Those are the only things that this, languages know how to do, this language knows how to do. And then we just need to say in here, well, if you have an addition, scrap it, product node, that's now gonna be called binary node. We're gonna rename that, we're gonna rename that, we're gonna rename that, and that. And then we just need to put another rule in here, which says, if you get a binary operation with two decimals in it, look at the operator and see what it is. If the operator is multiply, is add, we want you to return this plus that, left plus right. If the operator is multiply, we want you to return left-hand side times, 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 come on. There it is. Times, right-hand side. See if it works. Now, product node doesn't exist anymore. So when we see something times or star something, we want to give back a binary node with the multiply operator. When we see something plus something, we give back a binary node with the add operator plugged into it. Go in, .NET run, boom, there we go. You can trust me, one times two plus three times four times five is in fact 105. Right, how are we doing? We have 18 minutes to finish this and then show you how to do some crazy rock star stuff. So, I'm gonna skip past that bit. Variables. We need to be able to capture values in variables, look them up, and pull them back later. We want to be able to run programs that look like this. How are we going to do that? Well, first thing we need to do is we need to add the grammar. What does a variable look like? Now, at the moment, we are using this let something be expression. So the syntax for this, we now need to add assignments. So Zeppelin knows about those as well. An assignment is always going to look like let variable be expression. What is variable? We don't have it yet. We'll plug that in a second. When we see one of those, we return this assign node. A variable node is something that has a name, and we've said that a name here is a sequence of letters, and when you see one, bring back a new variable node that includes that name. Let's see what we get when we actually go in and execute this. So assignment node, like a lot of the things we looked at, some of this starts to look very familiar. We've got the variable, and we've got the expression. And we've got a constructor that says, well, if you give me a variable and expression, when I get evaluated, what I'll do is I'll take that expression, I'll evaluate it, I'll put it into the result of that variable. We're gonna plug in our variable node. Variable node is just a place to keep names. It just identifies that we've stored the name of a variable in somewhere. We could have done this with string, that's what I'm gonna do with functions in a second. Didn't want to, thought this was a, a slightly more interesting way of doing it. Now, this is magic code that I'm copying and pasting. This is just so when we print these variables out onto the um, syntax tree on the command line, we're gonna be able to see what the name of the variable is. Otherwise, they just all come out variable, variable, variable. And if you look at this syntax block up here, we've got an assignment, x, one, two, three, we've got an assignment, y, four, five, six, and then we have unrecognized node type because we've trained the grammar, but we haven't built the evaluator for it yet. So let's build an evaluator for it. So, in order to use variables, we need a way of, instead of just declaring numbers, getting a number out of a variable, which means we need to define a lookup node. So a lookup node, we give it a variable name, it'll tell us the value that is currently in that variable, We've modified our arithmetic rules so that at the bottom of the st stack now, you remember we had this thing of like, see if you can find things to multiply. If you can't, see if you've got anything to add. If you can't, we've now said, we'll see if there's anything you can go and look up. See if there's any variables here. If there's no variables, look for a number. If there's no numbers, failed. But hopefully we'll find a lookup on the way down. So we got a value here, returns a syntax node, takes a lookup, and the lookup syntax just says, give us a variable name, put the lookup node in that. We're gonna implement support for those now in the evaluator. So, if we see an assignment node, we're gonna create a method called assign. If we see a lookup node, we're gonna create a method called lookup. Now, what assign is gonna do, this evaluator needs somewhere to store variables so we can remember what we saw and what the values were. Easiest way to do that is just to plug in a dictionary of string and object. String is the name, object is gonna be the value that we're storing. So, 
We're going to plug that in. And then our assignment implementation actually becomes pretty simple. So first of all, look up, look in the dictionary, see if you can find the variable name in there. We're going to use the variables.tryGet value here because it may fail. And if it fails, we want to be able to handle that exception. If you do get a result, return it. And if you don't, undefined variable. So if we try and look up something that doesn't exist, the evaluator is going to fail. It's going to say, I don't know what that is. I can't help you. We could have done it differently. We could have said always return null. Assignment basically just does the opposite. Get the name. Now, the expression here, we actually want to work out what that is before we store the value. And then put that into the variable dictionary, plug the name in there, and then return it. That's it. So we've just built variable support into our language. We're going to jump across. We're going to now try running the example code with that. Let's see what happens with that. Da -da 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 -da. Boom. It worked. So we've got assignment. We've got assignment. We've then got this thing here. There, thank you. Um, where we've said, OK, we're going to take a variable z that is the addition of look up what is in x, look up what is in y, add those together, put that into z, and then look up z and output that, and we get 579, which is the sum. Right. Time for the really, really fun part. Functions. It's not a proper language unless we can create and call functions with it. So first thing we need to do, we need a way of giving functions names. Now, in Zeppelin, a function is not a variable. You cannot assign functions to other functions the way you can in some languages like JavaScript. So we're going to break some of our rules up, and we're going to create this new thing called an identifier. We're going to say that a variable now has a name which is an identifier. We've got two new types of statement, function and return. We need to be able to support both of these. Function has a name which is an identifier, then this keyword takes, argument list, then an end of line, and then the body, which is a block. So you see the way we're reusing all these little elements that we've built over the course of putting the, the system together. When that happens, we're going to return a new function node, name, args, body. What is this thing, arg list? When you call a function, you say it takes this and that and that, and those things have to be variables, because they're not expressions. They're the names of the things which get passed in when that function gets run. So an argument list. Same head tail syntax that we've seen previously. It's either a head, then the and keyword, and then the tail. The underscore here, by the way, just means separating white space. If we see one of those, make a new list, put the head in, can cap the tail onto it, give us back a list which is actually, in this case, it's an i enumerable, because that's what .NET's concat gives us. System.link, because the grammar needs to know how to plug into .NET to do that piece. Otherwise, if you just see one of them on its own, Please take it, wrap it up in a list of variable nodes, and give that back to us. So we now have this syntax. We've got a way of defining an argument, a way of defining a list, a way of defining a function. Last thing we need is a way of saying we'd like to return something from this function. To do that, we have this return keyword. We have an expression, and that gives us a return node. So we can return any expression as part of a block. Right. Implementation time. So. Function node, name, easy enough. We have a list of variables, which are the arguments used when calling that function. And we have the block, which is the body. And as with most of this stuff, one of the interesting things with building compilers like this in .NET, do you put the behavior in these node objects, or do you put all the behavior in the evaluator? I've made the decision that there's no behavior in these. These are just kind of placeholders that represent the structure of the program. You could have done it differently, but most of these just end up being data structures with a constructor and a couple of public fields. args.2 list there, because the argument on the constructor is an i enumerable. This is more magic code that I've pasted in to make it render nicely. It's on GitHub. If you're interested, you can go and look at it later. And then the return node. Well, we can return any expression. Functions can give back anything. So return node, give it a syntax node, and we're going to capture that in this property called expression. And that's what we're going to give back. OK. Let's run it, see what we get. What we should get is unterminated code section because I'm stupid. I've made this mistake about a million times in the course of building this. 
The thing inside the angle brackets in Pegasus is an expression, not a statement, so you don't have to return. You just put in there the thing that you want. OK, bang. So we have now a function syntax. This function sum, it takes two arguments, x and y. It has a body, which is a block. The parse is working. The grammar is working. Unrecognized node type function node. So this is the interesting part. So what does a function actually look like? Well, declaring a function is really easy because when you declare a function, we don't do anything with it. All we're going to do in here is we're going to plug in and we're going to say, all right, we'll take the function name and just stick it in. For now, we'll just use the variables dictionary. Capture the function, put it there. That way, we can look it up later when we need it. Variables, f.name, and we're just going to store the entire function. That gives us a way of going in and looking at it later. And we have to return something. So in this case, we return f. We have no behavior yet that relies on that, whether it works or not. Run that. Doesn't do anything. It doesn't do anything because our source code for this declares a function, but it never calls it. So program works. Let's look at what we get next. So. Here's our function declaration. We're going to add some code into this that then actually calls that function and does something with it. So we're going to declare two variables, a and b. a is 1, 2, 3, b is 4, 5, 6. We are going to say let c, or which is our total, be sum taking a and b. That is our function call syntax. And then we are going to say c. This is new. We haven't built the idea of a function call expression before. In order to plug that in, our values can now be, as well as lookups and numbers, we have function calls. A function call is name, the identifier, what's the function? The keyword, taking, that's how we denote function calls in this language. And then an expression list. An expression list is like a variable list. It's either one thing, or it's one thing with a bunch of things behind it. Now, in this case, when we call a function, we want to evaluate all of the arguments first, and then when we've got the values, we pass those into the function invocation. That's where we actually run it. An expression list is an enumerable of syntax nodes. It has the same structure we've seen before. You can have a head followed by and followed by a tail, in which case build us a list by concatenating all of these things together and give us back the enumerable that's pointing at that list. Or we have an item, which is just a single argument to the function, in which case, put it in a list on its own, give us a list containing a single thing. So we've got the name, we've got the expression list, we've got function call definition. The grammar for this is now done. Let's look at what we need to do to actually make it run. So oh yeah, I'm going to rename some stuff. We're going to call this call node. So let's go in and create a new file. So call node lives in our syntax tree. What a call node says is, well, what function did you try and call? And what were the values, the arguments, the expressions that you supplied when you asked to call that function? That will be a list of syntax node. And again, we're going to plug in the constructor here. What was the function name? Give us the enumerable, because that's what concat yields when we call it. Drop in some more magic code. This stuff, by the way, is just the way that that uh, syntax tree gets rendered to the console. It uses string builders and recursive padding to give us that nice kind of tree layout. So there we go. We've got a successful parse tree out of declaring a function, declaring some variables, calling it. Unrecognized node type call node. Now, this is the really fun part. In order to declare functions, one of the things that we need to worry about is when we return something, it should stop. It shouldn't continue returning the, the rest of the code. Now, 
Uh, I'm going to dig into this code in a second. I'm sorry, I've missed a video snippet there. Um, let me pause that. <laughs> it was going so well. <laughs> okay, so when we have to return something from the way a function invocation works, that's a special operation. It isn't just a value. It's a value that says, here's the value, and by the way, give this back and stop everything else that you were doing. So we're going to create a new thing in our interpreter, which is called a return result. And we're going to go in and we're going to say, if you encounter a return statement, I'll show you call in a second because we've lost the video with that on it. But create a return based on that object. And then this create return thing, as you can guess, we're just going to say, well, give us a new return result with one of those in it, evaluate the expression, wrap that up, and give that back. And the reason why we're doing that is that then when we look at the method which evaluates a block of statements, We're going to say, if you see a return result, return immediately. Now, this is where the syntax gets really horrible, because we have results and returns. .NET has returns. Our language has returns. The whole thing gets a little bit complicated, but we've now got working function call and return syntax. And if we go and plug in there x and y, return 1, return 2, return 3, just to prove that this is actually working, So we've got back one, two and three didn't happen. Right, we have two minutes left. I am just going to show you one piece of code. Um, <laughs> um, so the way that that evaluator thing worked. Um, what I'm going to suggest we do as we have run out of time and not got onto the little interesting bit at the end is I'm going to take my laptop outside after this and I'm going to implement some of the crazy rock star stuff that I showed you in the slides at the beginning. And if anyone's interested in seeing how we do that, come and find me outside in a second, but they need the room back in like two minutes. So let's have a look at what actually happens when we run a function call. Um, now, the way a function call basically works in most languages, is it takes all the variables you gave it, and it effectively says, well, let's pretend that all those arguments were just defined before. We'll run the block of code that represents this function body and see what we get out of the other end. So what we're doing in here, the first thing we're doing is we are calling a method called create scope. Create scope is defined up here. It takes the evaluator that we're running. It creates a new one. It copies all of the variables from our evaluator into the new one. It sets the new one's parent to reference this, which will be important later or in, in later iterations. We're not using it at the moment. And it gives it back. So that effectively gives us a new evaluator. This is where languages like JavaScript get their idea of functional scope from. When you start running a function, it creates a block which has its own variables. When the function exits, all of those variables are either returned or they're discarded. Then what we're doing is we are taking the names and the values from that function call and checking that there's the same number of each. You can't call a five argument function with two arguments. We're copying all of them into that scope. So what we have now is a new environment, a new evaluation scope where all those variables are just plugged in already. And we are just saying, well, fine, once you've got the scope, evaluate the function body, give us back the result of that. We are going to wrap it up there. We have just about managed to implement a recursive descent parser for an esoteric programming language inside of one hour. I'm going to go outside and do some interesting rock story stuff and be available for questions and everything. Thank you very much.